in the past without using the flood is doomed to failure. If you deny truth, you'll never come to truth otherwise. I'm convinced that if the flood happened, since that was a catastrophic event with the walls of mud, with the mud flows, with the tsunamis, with the, with the floodgates of heaven opened, we ought to see that most of the major rock units were laid down catastrophically, dramatically, with intense forces, perhaps the same forces that we see going on today, like erosion and redeposition, but at rates and scales and intensities far greater than anything even possible today. Since that flood was operating on a global scale, since it covered the world, we ought to see that many of those rock units laid down by the flood were on a regional scale, extensive, as opposed to modern sorts of depositional processes, which would be in a delta or a riverbed or a beachfront or a lake bed, something like that. We ought to see regional stratigraphy as opposed to local stratigraphy, just like we ought to see catastrophic deposition evidence of that rather than evidence of slow and gradual deposition. We ought to see erosion on an incredibly large scale. We ought to see extensive amounts of volcanism, particularly in those latter stages of the flood when the continents were being raised up and, and all of that tectonic movement should have, a, well, there should be a lot of volcanism there toward the latter stages of the flood. And uh, then I'm also convinced that one of the predictions of the, what the Bible has to say is that there would be a time of readjustment after the flood and in that readjustment, there would be the perfect opportunity for an ice age. So we want to come to that at the end of, the, at the end of this lecture, because I think the ice age is one area where the, the, the flood model really, really shines. Point one here, talking about catastrophic deposition, let's look first at fossils. I'm convinced that fossils themselves, the very fact that there are fossils is evidence that, that something catastrophic was involved in their deposition for a fish, say, and, and we find fish by the multiplied billions all crammed in together. We find fish maybe by the trillions of fish fossilized. What happens to a fish when it dies? That fish when it dies, it either rises to the surface where it's eaten by scavengers and bacteria and it's gone very quickly, or it sinks to the surface where it's eaten by bacteria and scavengers and it's gone fairly quickly. The only way to fossilize a fish, particularly a whole, you know, a whole a graveyard of fish is, is frequently the way we find them, is to bury that fish when it's alive or maybe just recently dead before it has a chance to decay and disintegrate. And then once that thing is buried in sediments, then those sediments can, can harden and turn into solid rock. It doesn't take millions of years to fossilize something. It just takes preservation and then the right conditions and, and protection from the elements and, and from scavengers and then it has an opportunity to turn into a fossil. Not only do we find fossils like this, we just find them, we just find them in, in mass graveyards. Big ones, little ones, all sorts of fossils, uh, fossil dinosaurs, amazing numbers of, of fossils. Many of them broken and battered and bashed and not so much decayed and eaten, but just, just destroyed, mangled by forces of a catastrophic intensity. Of course, the evolutionists will interpret the fossils as uh, having been laid down over long periods of time and, and arrange them according to the geologic column, which is really a statement of evolution. The idea being that long ago these creatures lived and they evolved into these and into these and went to the dinosaur age and then to the mammals and then finally the man uh, evolved in just the last few million years. This distribution of the fossils, this presentation of the fossils is really, as I say, a, a statement of evolution. This particular column of fossils is never found anywhere in the world. It's, it's a, it's, this is the evolutionist Bible actually is what it is. It's an evolutionary statement more than anything else. In fact, in the Grand Canyon, you don't find all this. The Grand Canyon is thought to be one of the sterling examples of the geologic column, but in the Grand Canyon, you'll find some of this and some of this and some of this and some of that, but none of this and none of this and, and you just find a few. And the Grand Canyon is one of the best spots. To the extent, however, that this column exists, and I would not want to give you the impression that it doesn't exist, that it's, it's just a, um, a uh, figment of the imagination, there is a tendency in which the fossil order follows this trend. But I'm convinced there's another possible explanation for it, and that's the flood explanation. Notice that these sorts of organisms which live down here at the 
uh, in these bottom periods in the column, these are supposed to be long, long ago. These are the early things that evolved and changed into these, into these, and, and on up. But um, these sorts of things are the sorts of things that live at the bottom of the ocean. That's their habitat. They live in the low places. They live at the bottom of the ocean. As this flood began to occur, the very first things that would be deposited would be those things that live at the bottom of the ocean. The first burst, the first episodes would bury those things in the low places and then finally the waters would encroach farther and get the, the upper dwellers and the surface dwellers and the, and the coastline dwellers and the swampy dwellers and, and it would continue to encroach farther and farther. I'm convinced that that geologic column is, well, it's replicated by an ecological column. These are the things that live at the bottom of the ocean. Then you get the upper dwellers and the coastal dwellers and the swampy dwellers and, and on up into the upland dwellers. It's the same series, and that's the series on a general sense that the flood would have deposited them. There's more than one interpretation of this geologic column, and I'm convinced the flood makes sense out of it, perhaps even in a better way than the evolutionary uniformitarian methods. There's a, this is a real interesting time to be a creationist. It's just a, in fact, it's a wonderful time to be a creationist because so much of the evidence is just coming right down in our laps. I mean, I, I just really love it because, well, <laughs> in geology, while geology has been dominated by this concept of, of uniformity for a couple, three generations now, it's shifting. It's shifting toward more of a catastrophic look at, at rocks. Uh, creationists have been talking about catastrophism in geology all along, but the evolutionists nowadays, well, they're leaving uniformity, they're leaving the uniformitarian concept, and they're going to what they call neo-catastrophism. They don't want to be called catastrophists because that sounds like creationists, but they call themselves neo-catastrophists. Most of the leading geologists would identify themselves as neo-catastrophists these days. One of the one of the observations that's leading geology to adopt a more catastrophic view of nature is this concept of turbidites. Turbidite, you know what turbid means, turbulent, uh, that sort of a, that's a, this, the derivative of that word. A turbidite is by definition a deposit that was laid down underwater formed by catastrophic, turbulent water currents. That's the definition of turbidites, and this is a very important concept in geology these days. It stems back to an example, uh, a, an event that happened in 1929 when a submarine landslide broke loose off the continental uh, shelf, off the coast of Nova Scotia, and this material slid down uh, into, the, into the ocean abyss from the continent, and this submarine landslide set up what's called a turbidi turbidity current. This current went screaming away from that area, at 60 miles an hour. That's how fast this thing was flowing. It was a layer of mud, water and mud mixed up, and it was just a, a super dense layer of mud that screamed along the bottom of the ocean at a speed of 60 miles an hour, a velocity of 60 miles an hour, and it went out for a distance of 430 miles away from that area into a fan-shaped deposit, and before that thing was over, just in a few short hours, it covered a zone of 40,000 square miles with a bed thickness two to three feet. We know that happened at that speed because in 1929 there were many transatlantic telephone cables crossing the Atlantic and, and uh, they broke in the face of this uh, submarine landslide. And this one broke and then that one, boom, boom, and, and they were timed so we know what velocity this thing was, was traveling at. And then in the 50s and 60s when submarines were developed to go down and, and study this, this deposit, they were able to see its extent and, and the nature of it, but the more they studied it, they said, uh-oh, because that bed, that deposit laid down by that turbidity current, that major catastrophic thing that covered 40,000 square miles in a matter of three or four hours, was exactly like many of the layers over in the Appalachian Mountains. That deposit looked like these rocks. These were interpreted to be slow and gradual deposits like in a delta or, or something like that. Just a, a, a gradual, calm deposition. But in fact, these rocks look just like that rock, and now geologists are going back and reinterpreting all these other rocks that had been interpreted as slow and gradual deposits, and they're saying, 
They were turbidites after all, catastrophic deposits, and come to find out up to a half 